to do, let's go ahead and uh, turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Last week, uh, we talked about the characteristics of a good friend, right? We mentioned, or I mentioned that when you're looking for a good friend, integrity is 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 important, right? They're strong morals, right? They know the difference between right and wrong. And we also said that one of those other characteristics of a good friend is that you can trust them, right? Honestly, and they can speak from the heart with good intentions, and they never go behind your back, right? This is a trustworthy friend. The other is dependability. Dependability is their middle name. Their promises are held. When they're going to say they're going to do this, they are committed in doing so. You can depend on them through the thick and thin of life. The other is loyalty. Loyalty to you, loyalty to your friendship, loyalty to your family. They're non-biased. They give you the benefit of the doubt and they defend you. But if you're wrong, they will tell you as well. That is a hallmark characteristic of a good friend. And last but not least is empathy. Empathy for others. Empathy in caring, right? They feel for you. They do their best to understand what you're feeling and react accordingly. Well, this week, we're not just talking about the characteristics of a good friend, but we're also going to talk about the characteristics of a good family or a strong family. According to the University of um, uh, Michigan, sorry, uni- University, sorry, Michigan State University, sorry, sorry about that. My, there are six qualities that researchers have identified as indicators of a strong or a good family. All right, because that's what we're talking about today. Number one, and this is from a secular, uh, secular institution writing these things. Think about it. Take heed. Number one, appreciation and affection. So a family, those characteristics are, is, 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 you want them to be strong, is that they, have, they appreciate, they help each other. They keep promises. They show affection with each other. That's important. Affection is a normal, normal emotion that God has placed in our hearts, right? Number two, they are committed. Strong families are very loyal to each other. They don't leave them hanging. They share equal responsibilities. Right? They make decisions together. They allow members to make their own decisions with support. It's not like, hey, you know, I'm the one wearing the pants here. I make the decision. No. It's, there's a balance. There's communication. There's a bridge. They're committed for the purpose of the family. Number three, positive communication. Positive communications, families that eat together regularly, as long as the phones and TVs are turned off, they are likely to share feelings with each other. They cue on each other's feelings, right? They put down the they they put down the the downs and the sarcasms, right? They communicate clearly with their emotions, right? Number four, strong coping skills. Families with healthy well-being tend to be resilient. When crisis comes, the family comes closer. They support each other. They look for something good in the bad situation. Does that make sense? So it's, it's more of like, hey, what is God teaching us? What is God teaching you, brother, sister, right, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And we challenge, they challenge each other. They accept each other, right? And uh, a few more things. Number uh, uh, one, two, three, four. Number five, healthy spiritual well-being. Okay, this is coming from a secular institution, right? Healthy spiritual well-being. It is easy for them to share spiritual values and beliefs with one another. Again, the communication is open. Positive attitude in the norms and they have the sense of peace. Right? So so think about it. Many of you guys have moms where you can share deeply. Maybe struggles that you have. Dads, you could, you could share that, right? And then last, spending time together. There is shared common interests with strong 
families. They love to spend time together. They have lots of fun together. They laugh plenty, right? That's a good medicine. It's free medication. It's laughter. Unplanned, spontaneous activities together are common. So you notice that this is a secular study, right? Does not imply how much the breadwinner makes in the house. How much his or her awards are, or what uh, seat they have, what offices they, they hold. Instead, these are biblical standards of family. Some found in Proverbs 31, some found in the Proverbs women, some are held in Genesis 2, Genesis chapter 3, in the creation of man and the role of a man and a woman. So nonetheless, all these family strengths are connected. They overlap with some degree and interact with each other. These family strengths become interwoven like a big ball of strings collected over time. And the more family practices traits, the more resilient they are ready to face the mission Christ has bestowed upon each family unit. So family is a blessing, right? Today I'm going to speak about Family, as a father relates to his children. So the background of 1 John in context, right? Before we start the book of the Bible, we always want to see what is going on here. What is the context? What is the, the emphasis? What, is, what are the themes? Okay, who is he talking to? So the, 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 John is the apostle. He writes to this Ephesian church to encourage them and to remind them who Jesus is. And we see these two common things is love and truth, truth and love circling through throughout the book of First John. Okay? In the midst of the pagan city with great Greek influences that has happened around that area. As I mentioned last week, this area in Ephesus is where the goddess of, uh, of uh, Diana, she's the god of fertility. So there's a lot of Worship. There's worship between a mother and his child taking extreme, right? There's a lot of sexual immorality. There's a lot of just tons of different things, idols that are uh, very dominant in that culture. So John speaks and he writes this letter to these young Christians, for most likely first generation Christians at that time to encourage them love and truth, truth and love. Right? Because when you're bombarded with this culture, cultural push of paganism and do, doing whatever you want, sometimes our faith is challenged. So he writes to them, therefore. So the, these are first generation Jewish Christians who were bombarded with lies, false idols, false prophets, false promises. They're fleshly and they live in carnal lives in this pagan society. So he writes to them, Truth and love of Jesus Christ played over and over again. All right. So today we're gonna just read two verses. All right. First John chapter two. Let's all stand up in reverence of the Lord's word. It says here in First John chapter two verse one, "My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin." If anyone sins, we have an advocate. We're going to break down that word. With the Father and Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation. We'll talk about that. For our sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. This is what the Lord says. You may be seated. So the context is, is is John the Apostle, right? So John the Apostle, who witnessed, who God, Jesus Christ, hand-selected to be one of his apostles, is speaking to these young Christians, as I said earlier, right? To remind them of the Father's love. So he speaks in the form of a father, a parental figure of authority and experience. So this is much older John now. And he says, my little children. See, he's the greatest helper. The father is the greatest helper and the greatest resource that this world needs. This young generation of Christians in Ephesus. John the apostle who was walked 
with Christ. So he says this, number one, my point number one is, friends of God know the Lord's voice. Friends of God know the Lord's voice. See, John, the apostle, writes and he takes hold of these young Christians and young Christian generation and he says, don't give in to the life of sin. Don't give in to the life of the flesh. And we'd be, you know, we as, as men, we're going through Galatians and last week went through Galatians chapter 5 and it distincts between the spirit and the flesh. You know, Right? Paul says, and he prescribes, don't live, don't even give the, the devil an opportunity, the enemy an opportunity for him to live in you in the flesh. We have an option now. We have the Spirit. Right? So he says, don't give into the life of sin. He didn't say, hey man, hey dude. No, he, he takes aim as a father who loves his son and he loves his daughter. He reminds them in chapter 1 who Christ is, that he's, the, he, this is a good review, that Jesus was in the beginning. And how he, G, John, has walked with, with Christ. He was an eyewitness. He touched his hands after the resurrection. Wow, so that's the only testimony that he has. And that's the only testimony that we need to be reminded to be focused on Christ. That is essential. And it applies then as this book was written, right? First century AD and applies today specially. And I'm going to kind of share a little bit here, okay? This young generation, how do you convince this young generation to listen to, listen to the Lord's voice? Do we text them? <laughs> what do we do? Do we do like TikTok videos and share them, right? No, it's more than that. Let me just share with you. Let me unpack to you what we could do to be able to convince this young generation to not follow that sinful life. Okay? Now let me share with you this uh, George Barna, George Barna uh, research, did a, did a, um, a study in September 2011. These are six reasons why young Christians leave churches. I'm not going to mention all six. There's a lot of them. I'm going to mention maybe two or three. So, but let me preface this. Let me preface this. This is research, okay? And reading this research, I got really irritated. But I see opportunities of when the church comes together. So let me just share with that. So this research, there's the sample size. The sample size are teenagers and young adults, parents, youth pastors, and senior pastors that were all asked these same questions. The study of young adults focused on those who were regularly churchgoers at Christian churches during the teen years and explored their reasons for disconnection from the church after the age of 15. Right? So that was the whole purpose. They did the research and asked these teenagers, young adults, parents, youth pastors, senior pastors on why these children aged after 15 leave churches in general. Point number one. Reason number one. Churches seem overprotective is what they're saying. Okay, and I'll share with you. A few of the defining characteristics of today's teens and young adults are in their unprecedented access to ideas and worldviews, as well as their uh, pr uh, prodigious consumption of popular culture. In other words, as Christians, they ex express the desire of their faith in Christ to connect to the world they live in. However, much of their experience of Christianity feels stifling, fear-based, and risk-averse. Right? So... One quarter of this study says that Christians demonize everything outside the church. That's what it's saying. All right. Furthermore, other perceptions in this category includes churches ignoring the problems of the real world. That's 22%. And that my church is too concerned that movies and music and video games are harmful. That's why they disengage from the church after the age of 15. Now again, this is a research which I don't agree with, but I see opportunities, right? Just as a father, right, John, he writes to these young Christians in this city called Ephesus. These are first-generation Christians. So this is an opportunity. 
right? Maturity of Christians is a huge factor. What they see, how, how much they are exposed, depends on their maturity. Now, each one, as you guys know, if you have children, each, per, each of your child's maturity varies, right? So there's no one size fits all. You guys know this. If you have several children, they're all very different. Different personalities, different headaches, etc. that you have. You saw in this video, when I was watching it last night, you see the transition from having a teenager and suddenly the mom just had gray hair, right? Right, white hair, sorry, white hair, right? So their maturity level differs. Your parenting style differs. What you expose them differs based on their maturity, right? So each child has their own set of maturity level, their personalities, thereby should be determined their access to the world and what you share with them, right? Some you have to kind of share and continue to educate and re-educate. Some not. You may have to have move on to different things. So here's my, my opportunities here that I want to share with you guys. My charge. Parents. Not just parents, but if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a youth leader, whatsoever. Parents ought to know everything and engage accordingly. You need to know what's going on. You need to know. You know, and some of what you need to know is you can't live in a bubble. You have to know what they're facing. Last week I shared Instagram. It's an app. Just let you guys know what Instagram is. Children are, and adults are influenced by what people post in their Instagram, what they wear, what type of makeup, whatever they say, whatever they don't say. It's a huge, and you're probably thinking, why in the world would I be get influenced on on just on the screen, right? With people I don't even know. This is how this generation makes connection. And you better know what is going on, what content they are reading. Each child is different. Their personalities differ, right? So just be aware of that, and you have to engage prayerfully, right? And consider, and sometimes seeking counsel from others. Other parents are maybe one or two stage ahead of us. We need you to help us parent this young generation. Next is building bridges of trust and communication, right? This is parenting. Communicate. Right? Communicate your expectations. Communicate and, and, and then reward when needed. Right? Each one is built according to, to their, 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 their capacity. Be realistic when setting punishment and consequences. You can't say, oh yeah, you know what, you're grounded forever. Well, come on. Forever, really? That's really not realistic, y'all. Right? But do it in love. Always redeeming, always valuing, always bringing them back, right? Okay, and again, I'm going to challenge you. The parenting, the experiences you had as a child from your parents may be very different because, again, your child is different. So you, it might not, you know, it might not be the same thing, the same punishment, the same style. Maybe the emphasis may be different, right, or the same. Be realistic in setting punishment and consequences. You are the parent. You are not the friend. Okay? There are a lot of these worlds where we think, oh yeah, I just need to be buddies, buddies with my, whatever, my team. No! You're the parent. Be firm, yet loving. See, Jesus modeled this perfectly in his ministry. He was not a pushover. He was not a rug. He spoke, but he spoke it in passion. He spoke it with conviction and love. Don't forget that. That's hard. I know some of us, we struggle over that. I struggle over that sometimes, right? Be firm, okay? Pray for your youth leaders. Pray for our children's, uh, our, our Sunday school teachers. Be praying for them. So when they set their time to prepare for lessons that we have for our young ones, man, we need to come and just encourage them. Take the teachers out, Right? These youth leaders out, teachers, right? Just to share how much thankful, how thankful you are because they need encouragement too. And pray for cultivating godly friendship in your children. Okay, don't just say, hey, there are Christians, I'm going to just stick them all over there. Well, 
They may not be. You don't know that. Help them to build bridges to start working on those godly relationships. Number two, reason number two, again, according to this study, teens and 20-somethings experience of Christianity is shallow. Again, this is just a research. Teens and 20-somethings experience of Christianity is shallow. The second reason why young people depart church as young adults is that something is lacking in their experience of church. One-third says church is boring. One quarter of these young adults said that faith is not relevant, uh, uh, relevant in, my, in their career or interests. It's like, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to be a missionary. Right? So what is that? Uh, how does that, you know, I want to be a gamer or I want to be or whatever. Or that the Bible is not taught clearly or often not enough. Sadly, one-fifth of these young adults who ex- uh, uh, attend a church as a teenager said that God seems missing from my experience of church. Okay? Whether you believe it or not, this is a survey. Okay? So here's my opportunities. You know, here at church, I do my best to be able to preach and teach. And as you guys know, I'm kind of, you know, I, I'm evolving in my st- style of teaching as well. I'm learning, Right? I'm learning, but we here, we want to make sure that the scripture is forefront, right? It's not my opinion, it's not pastor's opinion, it's from here. And I could be challenged, I understand that, but I'm going to stay close here because I'm safe, because this is God's word, this is not my words. I preach, I teach, and I model the gospel every day. I try to do that. Yes, I make mistakes. I'm human, right? Okay? Who's not human? Okay? I'm human too. So I there, I say, Lord, forgive me. Joy, forgive me. Riley, Joel, my girls, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I own up to it. Okay? So that's what we are. We have to live out our life. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17 says this, All Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for tr- correction, for training in righteousness. Now, sometimes you don't have to beat people with, their, with the baseball bat, right? With the Bible. No. You share that in love, right? And that's way. And sometimes some people need a little uh, weapon, right? That's okay. But you have to be led by the Spirit. You can't be led by your fear or your insecurity. You've got to pray through it. Right? That's why there are other people that I encourage you to get to know. Say, hey, you know, I'm really struggling with my little young one. I'm struggling with my big young ones. <laughs> Whatever else it is, we are a church. When we engage together, we are unified and share our experiences. Yes, challenges and failures. That is normal, right? Okay, so I want to just challenge you with that. Verse 17, so that men of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Every good work. Not just work from like your daily secular work. No, it's not just school. It's everyday parenting. It's mission. It's whatever else you're doing. Right? Every good work because the Word of God says so. Let me just share with you a few things. The Word of God is supreme and central. Supreme and central. That's what it says in Latin, sola scriptura. Right? This is it. This is sola. This is the sola of all solas, is the Bible. The Word of God, number two, is before any program. Before you create, we create any programs, is it Bible based? Is it scripturally based? Right? Number three, the Word of God before any feelings. I'll say it again feelings. I'm not feeling this way. Well, the Bible says this, right? So sometimes, often, the Bible triumphs over your feelings, right? Let me just share with you an illustration. Uh, I was sharing my, this to my kids. So we, Joy and I, you guys know that we were uh, inner city, we work with inner city kids. These are high-risk, at-risk kids, right? Fathers are not in the homes. And we had this young girl, and she was in our program, she was a youth and she had a full ride to go and be an architect. Full ride at a, at a university, a top university. 
but because her feelings got in the way, this is what she said, you know what, I want to go and dance. Dance versus architecture. Man, you have the gift, you got the full ride, four years at a prestigious university to go to be an architect. And you want to dance, really? You can dance and part-time dance, whatever you want to do. So now, the whole, now what she does is she's an amateur wrestler. Come on. Amateur wrestler. What about your benefits? What if you get hurt? You need PTO. You need short-time disability, right? All these things that I'm thinking about, right? You want to save up, okay? Because you can only, la- I mean, you can't be wrestling when you're 60 years old. Maybe some of you guys do wrestling here. I don't want to offend. Sorry. If you're, if you're wrestling at your 60, hmm, I don't know. Anyway, sorry. So, right, the word of God before any feelings. Number four, the word of God before any political affiliation. Let me just share this with you. Whether you're right wing or left wing or in between, don't even have wings, whatever it is that you have, that does not constitute you from having eternal life in Jesus Christ. And this is really hot right now, right? Don't politicize any of your motivation. It has to be scripturally based. You'd be surprised when, you, when we're in heaven with the Lord and you say, hey, we're all my right wing and my left wing and no wing. You know, where are they? What did you do for Christ Jesus is the question. Are you a good manager with what God has given you? Or did you just relinquish it away because you were fearful and you hid it? So think about that, Okay. Number five, the word of God before any culture and any social norms. Any culture and social norms. Mission trips, right, is a great a, a, a thing to show them what it means to serve as a Christian society, Christian family, right? Cultural norms says, you know what, go ahead. You need to spend time together. Yes, you need to go on vacation. Go to... No, I'm not, I'm not against vacation. But you know what, when you think biblically... You say, hey, you know, how can my family be used for God's kingdom instead of using it for myself, right? Very different. Think about it. So we pray for our teachers. We pray for our children, right? Uh, Our Sunday school teachers, our youth leaders, right? Get to know. I want to challenge you. Get to know our children. Get to know our youth. And for, with permission, and say, hey, you know, can I do, can I take them out, you know, with their parents? Ask for permission. Can I t- just want to share with them? I want to, I feel like the Lord has, has told me to be able to kind of share and mentor some of these young ones. They need you. I don't care if you're six years old or older. God needs you. God needs you to share the gifts that God has given you to these little young ones. Number three, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Three reasons, right? Number three. Churches come across as anti, uh, antagonistic towards science, right? So there's a, a version of like, hey, you know what? Somehow the church doesn't talk about science. It's quite the opposite, right? Christians, right, it says here, the most common of the perception in this arena is that Christians are too confident they know all the answers. Three out of Ten young adults with Christian backgrounds feel that churches are out of step with the scientific world we live in. And another quarter embraces the perception that Christianity is anti-science. Think about it, okay? Do you guys know that God created biology? God created chemistry? God created physics? Right? Right? He, de- he, he declares and validates creation. But you've got to know this. You can't let just teachers teach this. You have to know this yourself. Do you guys know that the, the mere atoms that God created for you and me? Do you know that each of our blood cells, what they do, it's amazing. Fingerprints, our fingerprint is so unique to you only. That validates science 
right? Because God created science. So let's not be avert, have this aversion away from, and, 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 uh, from, from this field, right? Do you know that there are many doctors that I've shared and worked with who are believers in Christ? Man, amazing, amazing. Right? I knew um, a, a gentleman, um, he is uh, in our, uh, we have our African uh, kind of brothers uh, where we have clinics in Africa, okay? He was a pastor at a village. He was a pastor. He says, you know what? I need to bridge in this community. I feel so called to the, my community, my people. So he went to, he's a pastor and he went to medical school. And he comes back to the U.S., right, to be able to kind of get credentialing and all this training, etc. And he goes back to his African country. And he says this, Jackson, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. In these countries, people, these kids, they walk for several days barefooted to go see a doctor. (laughs) But he knows he can bridge together science and theology. Right? You might not be a doctor. You might not be a scientist. That's okay. But God's given you innate gifts and abilities to bridge that to this world. Think about it. So again, my point number one is this. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get to point two or three today. Friends of God know the Lord's voice. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 10, verse 1 to 16. John chapter 10, verse 1 to 16. Okay? If you have your phones, that's good too. Get an app, Bible app, version app, whatever else you use. It says here, I'm going to read. I love this passage. I could just, you know, if, if, if I'm on my way out of this world, I'm like, Please read, somebody read John. It says here, verse 1 of chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeepers open, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger, they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Let me just pause there. When I was in seminary, my missions uh, professor, he was a last IMB mission, him and another family. Last American IMB missionary in Afghanistan. This is in about 2005, 2006. They were pulling all Americans, missionaries, out of that country because of the war, right? So before they left, they said, you know what? We always wanted to go and go to the mountains of Afghanistan, or sorry, Afghanistan. So they go, they go there, the two American IMB, the last IMB missionaries in Afghanistan, 2006. So they go, and it was a day's journey. They go up to the mountains, and when they got up to the mountains, they saw literally thousands of sheep. And then each of these sheep, right, the, the sheep, they had, they had their uh, uh, shepherd from each tribe that was in that area. Not much has changed from biblical times. So they go and they ask these American missionaries, ask these chief, it says, how do you know which is your sheep and how do you know which is your sheep and how do you know how is your sheep? And the shepherd laughs. He said, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. (laughs) That's what it is. They didn't have any transmitter to say, hey, you know, these are mine or nothing like that. There's no division. They're all congregating. These sheep are all congregating together. But when the shepherd calls them, They all go to the shepherd. Same thing. We know when God calls us. And when God calls us, man, we need to be faithful. We need to be obedient. We need to ask, why is this happening? What are you teaching me, God, in this time? Because He loves, the Father loves the children, His children, He calls them, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. You have an option. We're going to talk about that. Let me go ahead and and continue with, uh, with John chapter 10, 
verse 6, this figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were, which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. See, as sheep, as children of the Lord, right, we know when that sound is nonsense. We know if that's counterfeit. We know if that's fake, fake, fake news or whatever else it is. Verse 9, I'm the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be, will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolves coming and and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand, is not concerned about the sheep. He's a fake. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own knows me. That's key. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I laid down my life for the sheep. This is cool right here, verse 16. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Okay? This is the Gentiles. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. This is the people of God. So it doesn't matter what political affiliation, it doesn't matter your level of education, it doesn't matter what seat you hold at work, the prestigious awards that you have, are you and can you listen to the shepherd's voice? And will you go to him and can you contrast the difference between a hired hand and the true master shepherd, Jesus Christ? Let me just share with you... Uh, And we as parents, we as adults more mature, we have a lot to give to this generation because they cannot contrast the difference between a hired hand and the Lord's voice. They're confused. They're hurt. I don't know what baggage experiences that they have. They're confused. God has used you to be able to be that that voice to point them to Jesus Christ. That's it. Right? All people, brown people, black people, yeah, even Chinese people will be one Gentile. We're one with the Jews. Right? I said that was a joke. I didn't get any. (laughs) Just kidding. Number two, this point number two, we'll uh, hopefully just wrap it up on here. Friends of God occasionally fall short. That is why we need an advocate. We fall short. Let's just be honest. Here in our text, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but all those of the whole world. What is an advocate? An advocate is a paraclete, right? It's the Greek form of this word, paraclete. It occurs three, five times Sorry, in the New Testament all used by the Apostle John. Well, what do you know? It is the Holy Spirit. It's not, you notice, other religions don't have the Holy Spirit. Right? Their God is dead. Right? Our God is alive. Be real. At some point in our Christian walk, you will fall short. Brothers will fall short. Sisters in Christ will fall short. We can't do it. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 3 says, For all have fallen short of the glory of God. This is the universal sin that we all inherited. It's in our DNA. It is the sin of Adam. Now you have an option. Under the law or under the Spirit. Who do you want to live by? You can't do both. Right? You are neither cold or hot. You can't be on the fence. You have to choose daily. 
Right? So let me just share with you some implications and benefits of the Holy Spirit. As a believer of Christ, whenever you confess your sins to the Lord and, and, and ask Him to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit, this happens instantaneously. It happens right away. The Holy Spirit now lives in you. And it says here, let me just share with you, just maybe four or five kind of implications of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit gives life. We see this in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is of the Spirit. Do not marvel what I said to you, Jesus says. You must be born anew. See, when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes and descends upon you and lives in you and gives you life. It's just a fresh air that's everlasting. Thus, He gives you a new life. He gives you a new purpose. He gives you new priorities, new passions. What you thought was really good back in the day is not good anymore because you've tasted the best thing. Why do you go back to your own vomit? Number two, the Holy Spirit gives power for service. The Holy Spirit gives power for, ser- for service. Isaiah 11, verse 2 to 3, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be it's to fear the Lord. Look at Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. This is the Spirit. This is the actual fruit of so when we become Christians, it's not just a skill that you're wanting, you've, you've learned to do when you were younger. No, it gives, it's more than that. The Spirit lives in you, and you can better serve not yourself. You can better serve the world. You can better serve our congregation. You can better serve the body of believers that God has. Number three, the Spirit guides and directs God's people. The Spirit guides and directs. God's people. Galatians 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Do not be gratified by the desires of the flesh, for the desire of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desire of the Spirit are against the flesh. See, He guides you. And sometimes, as a Christian, you know, like, hey, should I do this? No one's watching. I can really get away with this. But you know in your heart, man, I don't know, man. That's the Holy Spirit. It's not your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit that lives in you, right? Man, I really want to drive like 120 miles per hour. (sighs) No one's here. No one can see it. But the Spirit says, you know what? You better taper down because of your testimony as a Christian. You know what? I could really like cheat on my taxes. No one will ever see, blah, blah, blah. The Holy Spirit tells you, man, not a good idea. And on and on. The Holy Spirit gives direction and guidance to people, right? To his Christians. Now, let me just share with you. Um, Joe and I were able to go to a pastor's conference a few uh, months ago and uh, through the SBTC, and we met somebody by the name of Pastor Ali. And he shared with us, he is originally from uh, Iran, He's a pastor in the Dallas-Fort Worth area towards former Muslims. Amazing story. And he says this, he, he, was a, he, was, he was a Muslim, his wife a very devout Muslim. So they've, through business transaction, they moved to Istanbul, Turkey, right? So they go there and he gets a Yahoo message. Yahoo, okay? Not like Yahoo the email, right? He gets a Yahoo message about... The la- a, a lady that wants to talk to him. So he's like, okay, is this a scam or what? So after feeling led by the Spirit, he goes, not a believer at the time, he meets this lady in the market in Istanbul. No one, she, he's never met this girl. And lo and behold, this Iranian woman studying theology shares the gospel to him. And then within the matter of months, his wife and him go to their church and they get saved. The Holy Spirit leads. And now they're led here to our country. Witnessing, having a house church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Man, 
I feel like, wow, I need to hear that. Because when the Spirit leads and directs, man, you can't stop. (laughs) You can't stop it. Number four, the Spirit guides and directs God's people on where not to go. Okay? Not to go. Negative. It says here in Acts 16, this is Paul, right? They pass through the cities, Pharyngian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So what happened was they wanted to go there, but they were forbidden to go. The Spirit says, no, uh-uh, no, not. you're going the opposite. You're going to go westward to Europe. And then lo and behold, in Acts chapter 16, we, saw the t- we see in, at the end of that chapter where the first convert by the name of Lydia from, Ty- uh, from Tytheria, right? Here's the gospel and she gets saved and gets baptized. See, we must heed God's command when the Spirit says no and others say go. A famous quote here, and I, I don't know who wrote this, but he says this. We're Americans. We don't think. We just go and do. No. Sometimes that is wrong. You've got to think about that. Are you led by the Spirit? Or are you led by your own impulse? You've got to think about this. Right? So the role of the Spirit is that He is God. When you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. He's the power source. He's the counselor. He's the comforter. He's the encourager. He's your biggest cheerleader. He's the, he will give you courage. And when you're scared and alone, He will be there with you. He's untapped. This resource as Christians, let me tell you, whenever we start think, uh, talking about the Holy Spirit, we think we're like Pentecostals or something. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, dwells within believers. So be mindful of that. Use this for His glory, not yours. The Spirit also forgives. He restores, He rebuilds, He repairs. Some of you guys are here because of that. I'm here by the Spirit. Okay. Maybe I'll go through this real quick. Friends of God, number three, friends of God know that Jesus is enough. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, not only ours, but also those of the whole world. What is propitiation? This is a big word. Propitiation is a big word that means satisfaction. Because God is holy, his anger, his justice burns against sin, and he has sworn that sin will be punished. There must be satisfaction payment for sin. Right? So whenever you get a ticket, right, you have their satisfaction is to what? To pay the fee and maybe go to uh, traffic school, right? To satisfy what that is. But God said, if I punish men for his sins, men will die and go to hell. The other hand, if I don't punish men for his sins, my justice will never be satisfied. There's a cost. The solution, God said he would become our substitute. The atonement of Jesus Christ. And, and it could only be done by Jesus' Son, who is 100% God, 100% no sin. Only He could do it. Because of our sin, Jesus became sin for us and the whole world. So the result is this. Be humbled. Be thankful. Don't, don't throw away your salvation. Don't say, hey, you know, I got saved once and that's it. I use it for fire insurance. Man, you're missing out. Right? Let me just share with you this last passage. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. So then, my brothers, just as we always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says you can't work for salvation, but you have to work and exercise that through so you're being more refined and refined each and every day, right? We're more mature each and every day. If you're going the opposite, man, you need to like wake up. You need to be more and more refined today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, for calling us your friends. Moreover, calling us as your children. And Lord, we, we don't know that what that means truly. 
But Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us that we are not illegitimate. You care for us because you care for us. You, you, you admonish us. You correct us. You train us. You encourage us to continue to fight through. Lord, we love you. Be with us today as we celebrate this great Mother's Day, Lord. Help our, the moms to be appreciative of what, not what we've done, but what you have done for them. Thank you so much. Father, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.